many of you might have seen the, this presentation before, but this is a slightly different presentation. There's more information than before. We're touching back on some things. And with me, I have Anne and Anne <laughs> and Grace. We're all volunteers uh, and uh, we're here to really uh, answer questions. And uh, we're going to have some things to encourage participation. So first time for participation, right? What are things you care about, like issues or things you would like to see change? Anything, there's no wrong answers. And anybody that participates at all gets a piece of candy. Any, any thoughts on anything, big, small, anything, anywhere? Any thoughts? Anybody, any ideas? No, all right, we'll have more opportunities to, to participate, but I'm going to show you what some kids and people in general have mentioned before. Like, you know, a lot of people care about the environment or uh, cost of housing, cost of college, uh, like parks and nature and recreation, or cost of healthcare. How's our justice system working? How is our police, police system working? Schools, right? There was like a lot of people say, I would like a lunch hour to be longer because it's too short in school. So those are things that people care about. And guess what? All of those things are affected one way or another by people we elect. Um, all elections are important. We tend to hear more about big elections. But a lot of things that affect us every day are based on folks that we elect locally. One example that I like to use is if you have a pothole in your street, do you think you're going to call the president or the governor? Of course not, right? They're not going to kind of come here just to deal with a pothole. Who do you think you might call? The city. You can get candy already. Um, the city. <laughs> uh, or if you like the city, the county, depending on where things are, right? So it's like it's a local level. And there are a lot of things like that. If you want more bike paths, if you want, you know, if your parks need a little attention, it's all the city. So I don't know how many of you that actually saw this presentation before, uh, but this is the part that is new, right? We have a lot of elections in Texas. And in even years like we are now, we have really, really a lot. So. We have primaries, and I'll explain a little bit more about primaries, but primaries are uh, kind of like a pre-selection uh, between the parties of who is going to run in the big election in November. Uh, so in Texas, we have two parties that make the selection with primary elections, so we will actually go vote on those candidates. And there are two parties that they use conventions and caucus and other means to select the candidates that go forward. And this is for a bunch of different levels and not just president or governor, it goes down to many levels. In May, we have local elections uh, and there are the nonpartisan elections. They usually, there will be candidates or sometimes uh, propositions like ballot measures, like if you want to change some rules in the city, you use that. In many cities might uh, do mayor, city council, school boards and propositions, but some cities like Austin decided to move those local elections to November because you'll get more people to participate. So some will have local things and candidates in May, other that will be bundled up with the November election. So it really depends on where you live. But even in Austin, we might have a proposition in May. We, we don't know yet. Uh, then there's the big election in November, right? So even in the big election in November, people only think about what's called the top of the ticket, the president. Maybe people might think about senator or in the midterms might think about governor. But there's a lot of other things. Like we, in Texas, we vote for the Texas Supreme Court. We vote for uh, the Texas legislative. So they're the people that make the laws for Texas because we have the federal laws, but we also have the state laws. So a lot of the laws that you hear more on the news start at the state level. And we also, in Texas, we also elect judges, district attorneys, um, 
county judges. Um, so there's, there's a lot more. In odd years, we also vote on constitutional amendments. So we just voted in 2023 on 14 constitutional amendments. Those are, uh, the, the, the Texas legislative decides on those amendments, but if, uh, like if there is like a law that requires a change in constitution, not only they have to pass the House and the Senate, they also have to be sent to the voters for approval. So that's what we voted on in November. And there were things including like teacher retirement pay and many other uh, important ones. Uh, we also have uh, runoff elections. Runoff, uh, like a lot of people don't know what that means, but it's like, it's kind of like a second round, like in Spanish, it's a, a segunda, segunda vuelta. It's like, it's the second round. Like if you have like three candidates or more and nobody gets 50%, then you have the runoff to decide the, from the top two who wins the race. And you might have special elections if somebody finishes their term, like resigns before their term is done. And this is doing this again that I don't know why the button stopped working. That's for you. You can use the screen if the button is not working. So if any of you were here before, we discussed this data showing like how many people voted in the 2022 midterms. Um, does anybody remember like where the midterms, but do you know like in Texas who we elected in the midterms? Anybody knows what kind of position in Texas we elected in the, in the midterms? So we elected our governor in Texas in 2022. And even having the governor on the ballot, only 46% of the registered voters voted, right? So it's like, if you look at this picture here, this represents 100. So only this little number of people actually vote. So less than half voted, but everybody has to live with the governor, whether you voted for him or not, whether you could have voted uh, or not. So it's like, we all get the same, uh, the same candidate. And I was going to ask if you thought the primaries um, get more or fewer votes, but since I forgot, you can see that <laughs> in the primaries, it's much, much worse. The primaries is where you pre-select who's going to go. And that's when you have a lot of choices, right? But it's still a lot of people sit that out because they think it doesn't make a difference. It makes a big difference and it makes even a bigger difference because so few people vote that one vote matters a lot more because it's a bigger proportion of everybody that voted. Then uh, the key takeaway is we think there is like a you know elections and our vote doesn't matter. But if we don't vote, even if it's elections that we don't think is that critical or that we might not win. If we don't vote, we just give up the ability to have a say. And that means that somebody else is making all the choices for us and we're stuck with their choices. And this is a great time to plug a little uh, art project uh, or contest that the league has. Uh, and I have a couple of flyers I'll leave here that if you have any artistic inclination or if you like to write about stuff, uh, there is a competition going on until the first day of March where you can either uh, create a, a artwork or write about democracy and community. And you, there is a cash prize for the person that wins. And that's like, there is one at the high school level and there's one at the junior high and there is one elementary. So we'll leave information behind if any of you it's uh, artistically inclined or like to write about stuff. So I mentioned that the turnout is super low, right? It's bad enough that the turnout is low, but if it was like is low, but really proportionally representing everybody perfectly, it wouldn't be as terrible. But unfortunately, it's much worse than being low because it's not evenly divided. If you look at this chart here, like this is Travis County. In Travis County, we vote a little bit more 
than Texas at all. Like instead of 46, we're 52 percent. It's like we're barely more than half. But we don't vote evenly. If you uh, like look at the different colors, I'm going to put the numbers here. Each little area is like the precinct, which is kind of a tiny political subdivision. The lighter the color, the lighter the green kind of tends to yellow, it's like lower turnout. The darker green almost getting towards a bluish green, that's higher turnout. And uh, is there anything you kind of notice on this map? Like any, if you look at this map, what strikes you as, you know, what can you tell about this map by looking at it? Like any, anything that you observe? Like, where are the light color? What was the light? Where is the light green concentrated? Can you see like what part of the map? Uh, this is percent turnout. So like, there's people who live there. It's just people are not voting. So it's not it's not like number of people that voted. It's percent of the people in that area that could have voted. So here, this uh, like we here on Navarro. We are somewhere around here. This is our location. Like, I don't know exactly the precinct, but it's somewhere in this part of the map. Because this is I-35, and then like here you have Maynard, Elgin. So we are around here. So I don't know if you, most of you live like east of I-35, just about 35, more like north, south. But one thing you can know, and if you have looked at history in Austin, this, this trend of this divide in resources historically and uh, and then you see like, you know, it's been going on for a long time, but it's like almost like I-35 is a dividing line. And if you see here, that's reflected in voter turnout. It's kind of like a vicious cycle, right? Like areas that don't have resources, they usually are linked with a, a lower participation because if people don't vote, the politicians are less likely to listen to them. It's kind of, I don't know if you know the old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, those people are squeaky. Here, not so much. So like you are sitting here right now in a temporary building that has been temporary for what, 20 years? Um, there's... Yeah, so it's like, you know, it's a temporary building. That, and the reason you have that is because there are not necessary resources for schools in this area because there's not enough people, there are not enough squeaky wheels that are talking to their elected officials to make sure funding that we have for public schools goes everywhere. And that's the same with roads, with schools, with parks, with everything. Usually, the higher area, the participation with the highest areas get the most attention because the politicians know that if they keep them pleased, they are going to keep voting for them. But if you go to an area that nobody votes, they just tend to not pay them as much as attention. So those are things that can be, you know, that people can change by start voting. Another way to show how votes are not evenly distributed. And we'll have an opportunity for candy here, even though I don't have the little star. <laughs> um, so who do you think, like what age group you think votes more? You can say a number, a range, any, any guesses. There is no wrong answers. I mean, there will be wrong answers, but as far as candy is concerned, there is no wrong answer. Anybody has a guess of who tends to vote more by age or what kind of age group or like if you just want to say a number or a range, anything, any guesses, who votes more? Who said that? Sorry. <laughs> um, anybody else wants to guess who votes more? All right. So you're going to look at a graph here. When we came here before, uh, we went through more steps uh, showing first just who voted. So the people that voted, right now it looks faint because this is kind of the second comparison that 
instead of focusing as much on who voted, which are all the you know the light blue almost teal lines, uh, we'll focus on the red ones. So each little bar represents a age group that's six years. So this is 18 to 24, 25 to 30. So this group here is everybody that's Gen Z, right? Young people. And then 31, 36, like six years and going on until people get over 85, then it's all grouped. So a couple of things to pay attention. The, the people that voted, like that number of people that voted, it's, you know, it's not completely different in all the age groups. It gets lower as people get older because there's just not as many out there. But then when you look at the people that do not vote, do you see a pattern here? Like, what group has a lot of did not vote in their age group? Like, you can see who, who's, his, who's winning the do not vote category here? Yes, yeah, so who said that? Yeah, more candy. If I'm going to get good at tossing after this. So yes, yeah, like young people have a lot of not voting. So besides looking at just the absolute number, there's another thing to compare. See the size of the red versus the side of the little light blue. This one is almost like twice as many people didn't vote than the number of people that voted. So here's a little bit better, but it's still, you know, pretty high number. As you get older, the bars flipped. So that means that Older people leave fewer votes at the table. So the bad news is young people are not voting. The good news, you have so much potential. There's a lot of votes out there. And if you start voting, you have a lot more than the other groups, right? So it's like the bad news, you're not voting yet. The numbers are increasing slowly, but you still have a lot out there. So you have potential. And if you like to see things in terms of percentages, this is what's called turnout. So it's the number of people that voted divided by the number of people who could have voted. And this totally reinforced the trend. See, like, if you're under 30, your turnout is pretty much under 30, <laughs> like in the 30s. Under 30 are turning out under 30. So like they're leaving 70% of their vote out there. Then it's kind of steadily increases and people in the 60s and 70s, you know, they are just not leaving anything out there. But here's the kicker. Who is going to be alive the longest to deal with the consequences of those votes? Yes. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to start showing up? and? change like flip this trend i mean it would be super cool if either be a flat line at 100 percent, or if you just like let the older folks vote and then you just go and vote a lot more in fact this new slide plays a little bit with numbers and what if scenarios so this is the same data from that chart but we're going to show it as a pie but really a donut chart right so it gets each of those uh, little bars that we saw, it puts in uh, how much it means as a percent of the total votes, right? So you can see what was the contribution of young people. So this blue one is 18 to 24, right? Like anybody that's a high school and just going to college. And the yellow one is 25 to 30, like is when you're getting your first job. So it's like all combined Gen Z. So based on 2022 turnout, that's 19% of all the people that voted. It's kind of small. It's not tiny, but it's a small percentage of the total votes. So you have a little bit of a voice, but not really big. Well, if, if you actually use all your votes, because there are a lot of votes on the table for you to use, what could happen is like don't tell the folks over 30 to change anything they will just continue voting the way they are but all the young people decided this is the year that we're going to change those patterns this is the year where we are going to show up so if every person under 30 start voting 
you could have as much as 41% of the power if the older folks continue voting as they, they normally do. Things to keep in mind, even elections that are very lopsided, they're like considered a done deal, usually the difference is not more than 20%. So it could maybe 25 if it's like really lopsided. But most elections are defined by 15 to 20% cent, even in, in elections that are kind of pretty considered safe districts for one party or another. That means at 41%, you could pretty much dictate the fate of almost every election that you set your mind to. So this is a lot of power. But right now, that's not what happens, but could be. So, OK, let's, uh, let's make, uh, assume that you now understand why it's so important and you want to vote. Well, how do you go about doing it, right? In Texas, the first thing you have to do is get registered to vote because you have to register. You have to be registered 30 days before an election to be able to vote. And Texas doesn't have online voting, so it uh, makes it a little tricky, except that you are in luck because the easiest way to register to vote is if you run into a volunteer like us with uh, nice little forms that we're going to sign up, sign you up, and we'll take directly to the county. So that's the easiest way. Let's say if you don't have all your information or you're not uh, ready or you're, you're not uh, old enough, we can give you a mail form. Like, and you might be able to find in libraries and post offices in different places, right? But you can fill it out and mail it in because it's already prepaid. So that's the second easiest. Then if you prefer to go in person somewhere when it's your time, you can kind of go and you know, the, get your driver's license and be in person, make sure you verify that it's all done. Uh, or go, better yet, go to elections office. Like I recommend if you're going to do it, go to the elections office, uh, to the voter registration office, depending on the county. Then you guarantee that you're registered. So those are the ways to do it. But if you can do it today, I totally recommend. It's the easiest way. The question is, well, how do I know if I'm even eligible? The first thing is anybody to vote in Texas, you have to be a U.S. citizen. And some people get confused, uh, citizenship uh, or permanent resident, or like, how do I know? So if you're born in the US, you automatically a citizen. You know you're a citizen. Um, but like, I wasn't born in the US. I was born in Brazil. And I'm a citizen because I'm naturalized. So I went through the process. I immigrated here, and I got naturalized 20 years ago. Or like your parents worked abroad or like that you happen, you were born when they were abroad, but they were Americans, then you're already also a citizen. Or like if your parents become naturalized when you're under 18, you automatically are a citizen. So there are many ways and there might be other ways that I don't know. If you're not sure, after the presentation, we can talk one on one. You can, you know, check your with a, anybody at home with your family. Then there is age. You need to be 18 to vote. But you can register up to two months before your birthday and to be able to register today you have to be a you have to be born on or before march 22nd of 2006. so if you're born on or before march 22nd 2006 you can register to vote today i do put the felony uh terms here uh, one is because it's a requirement but also to compare with other uh, places in the u.s different states have different rules for that uh texas is sort of the middle of the road although towards the worst end of it uh, there are some states that if you get a felony it's like you either never have or it's really difficult to get back on the rolls in texas once you are off parole like if you're off paper you can vote again uh and there are two states there are a few states that as soon as you're off jail you can uh vote again and there are two states that you never lose your rights two states plus dc you never lose your rights so you can actually vote from prison while serving your sentence so it's like this is something that i like to put as a a note that election laws are not the same everywhere each state dictates that and um and if you know anybody that you know that would like to know that information, that's a good information to share. In the senior year, right, everybody, there's a 
a lot of people think, well, why should I bother to register now if I'm going to move as soon as I'm graduating? There are many reasons. The first is it's much easier to change your address. Like if you if you're registered with the ID, you can make the change online than to register for the first time. So register always where you are the moment you have a chance and then later you fix it. But the other reason is that there are a lot of elections. You're going to see that they, there are a lot of elections this year. So you're going to have the opportunity to vote three times, depending on how old you are, before you graduate. So even if you're going to move the day after you graduate, you can vote three times based on your current address. And if you go to college, you can decide if you stay registered in your hometown or you can change your voter registration to the, town, the college town you're living. You cannot bo do both, you have to choose one. It's similar in the military. Uh, you, have to, you can choose, define what's the residence of record. You can keep that your hometown or you can decide that it will be one of your future places in the military. Uh, if anybody is planning to do the military, I can actually send uh, the official language, but it's kind of some idea, which is another reason why it makes sense to say register, to register here. And you got registered, but that doesn't mean much if you're registered and didn't vote, because those percent turnouts that I showed before, the 40%, the 46%, the 17%, that is based on people that got registered so they were ready and able to vote, but didn't. So registering is a very critical first step, but it's not enough. You should show up. One of the reasons that a lot of people say they don't vote is because they do not want to be an uninformed voter and they don't know how to find the information. Uh, Texas doesn't make super easy to find, but luckily uh, there are organizations like the League of Women Voters that puts out a voter's guide, both in paper and electronic. The vote411.org is a great website that you enter your address and kind of filters and just shows everything that's on your ballot. That's really handy in ears that there's a lot of stuff on the ballot, especially a lot of local things, because then it shows exactly, okay, you're voting on this race in this district, you're voting for this school board, you're voting for this mayor or this city council. It really helps. The printed guide is nice if you like, prefer, like to read things on paper, but then you have to navigate which areas you can vote on. The other thing that is really cool about both the printed and the electronic version is that there is a candidate questions and answers. So the league creates questions, sends to the candidate, and they publish pretty much exactly what the candidates respond, except if it's something that's unprintable in the, <laughs> you know, that you can't print, not legally allowed to print. But in general, it's a great first step to learn about, about more candidates, especially in races that you might not hear as much on the news. Also, you know, talk to your friends, talk to your family, uh, just to see if they might have a reason where they vote for somebody and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I say, oh no, I don't agree with that. And it, it kind of like, it might help you. Uh, the more sources of information you look, the better informed you're going to be. Then uh, mark your choices. And here is another chance for candy. Uh, you cannot use your cell phone at the polling place. It can be in your pocket, your backpack but you cannot use. Anybody has any idea why you cannot use your cell phone at the polling place? Yes, anybody else? So yeah, because you know, as we see here, you can use the phone to record, take pictures, or even like, you know, be talking next to the person next to you and kind of talking through your choices. And it's like, you're kind of intimidating somebody. You could share information that some, you know, a voter there doesn't want to be shared. So it's like, if you have, you know, anybody with a phone, it's really, you know, it's, there's a really high risk that somebody is going to be taking a picture to share and intimidate somebody else. Uh, but you can take a piece of paper. So you can make your choices online. If you have access to a printer, you can print. But if not, you just write on a piece of paper. 
And if for some reason you show up to the poll and you forgot you only have that on your cell phone, just ask a poll worker and they say, you can go look at your phone like over there and then here's a piece of paper and pen and then you can fill it out. So like, don't turn around, just ask the poll worker if there is a paper. Often when they're busy days, a poll worker is going to go on the line offering people, do you have your notes? <laughs> uh, so that, you know, save trouble. Then the other thing you need to know is in Texas, you need a photo ID to vote. And uh, there are seven different types of ID, like Texas driver's license, election certificate, personal ID, a Texas gun license, uh, if you're naturalized, a citizenship certificate, military ID, passport, or passport card. So of all those IDs, and many IDs, is there a kind of ID that you all have that you don't see here? Like, is there anything missing there? Oops. <laughs> I'm the worst troller. <laughs> yes, there is no school ID. And it's not just high school. No college student ID. Not even teacher ID. Like, even if you work for the government, it's not one of the IDs that it's allowed as the principal ID. The, that's the bad news. The good news is that even if you don't have any of those, there is a, you can vote uh, signing a, you know, an extra piece of paper. And there's other IDs that you can use. Like, for instance, here, if you, once you get a voter registration certificate, you can take that. But let's say you didn't receive that before you go to the polls. You can use your birth certificate. There are some other IDs. So if you don't have any of those and you have questions, when we go around registering you guys, or we can talk more about it. So did anybody here watch Barbie? Do you like it, hate it? Uh, we're looking for a new meme. So if anybody has any ideas, I would love that because you know I don't like to keep repeating stuff from the past, but right now we're stuck with it. So here is a question. Anybody's willing to participate I mean, a very quick thing. You don't even have to get up or get out of your seat. Just like it takes like 10 seconds. Any volunteers? I'll give you double the candy. Or triple even if it takes. Like one of each caller. <laughs> uh, anybody we don't... It's super quick. You just have to pretend you're answering the phone call. It's super fast. Any takers? Nobody? No, I'll do it. All right, so uh, go along here. Uh, I'm going. We're old folks, so we're going to use the <laughs> the banana phone. Hi, Anne. It's Susanna. How are you? Hi, Susanna. What's up? Good. Well, not much. Do you want to go to, to the movies? Sure. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. See ya. So, are we going to the movies? How? Oh. Yeah, but. We're going to magically read our minds? Like, what movie are we watching? What yeah. Theater what theater, theater are we going to? When? Right? So that's the same thing. Like, you might say you're going to the movie, but if you don't know the details, you're not going to the movies. With voting, it's the same thing. You might be saying social media, but if you don't actually plan, before you know, the election date's passed and, and you didn't vote or you missed the voter registration deadline. So the first thing, first detail is when, right? In Texas, you can vote early, which means there's two weeks, not two weeks, 12 days before uh, election day that we can vote. So that makes it super convenient that you can vote uh, in a whatever schedule makes more sense. And usually there is smaller lines or no lines at all, depending on the location of early voting. Then uh, let's say you chose already the date and you know for sure which day and you even have a backup day in case that first day doesn't work. Where are you voting? In Travis County and pretty much uh, most of the surrounding counties, uh, during uh, early voting, everybody can vote anywhere within their county. And then election day in this county is like Travis, Williamson, Hayes, and Bastrop recently. You can also vote any polling location within the county. So you have to know which county you live and then vote there. Um, but Travis has a super handy votetravis.com website that has a map that shows 
the polling places and wait times. So not only you can see a place that is close or convenient for, you know, near work, near home, near school, near a place you like to hang out, but it also shows us the wait time. So that can help if there are two that are kind of close enough. You can see, oh, that it's a, it's a little farther, but there is no wait, so I'm going to go there. And how to get there, right? If it's close enough, can you walk, bike? Uh, do you have a car? Can you drive? Uh, do you need the bus? Uh, do you, are you going with a friend? So just figure out how you're going to get there. Because if it's like this morning, it was super rainy. And then if you had it to go walking, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people would say like, yeah, maybe I'll go another day, which is why it's so good to vote early. And what are we wearing? And so this is sounds like a weird question, but does anybody have any idea what kind of clothing you cannot wear at a polling place? Somebody's sharp here. <laughs> yeah, so you can wear like, you know, my vote shirt here. That's totally fine because it just says vote. You can promote ideas like that. But you cannot wear anything that has anything that's on the ballot either a candidate or a party, or if there is a proposition, right, a ballot measure, you can't say yay on A or yay on the parks fund or anything that is on the ballot because it's considered electioneering, meaning that you are trying to influence the people uh, that are voting at the time. You can do that outside of the polling place, but once you get in, no. But if you show up and you forget, it's like you don't have to go home. The poll worker is going to ask you either to go to the restroom and flip your shirt, or if you have a sweater, just cover it up. Or even in some cases, uh, like in Travis County, we have a paper bib that you can use to cover it up. So if you have a hat, take it off. If you have a button, like things, but if you have a t-shirt and you can't cover it up, there's a, like a little paper bib to, to cover it up. So know all those things. But this is the very first time you're voting. Make a plan. Go vote with friends and make a point of celebrating after. Like, go have ice cream, go have pizza, or just go hang out in the park. Just do something so you remember. Go outside the polling place, show all your selfies, take a picture, the, your stickers, take a picture, and send to Mr. Tabasco. He's going to be happy. <laughs> then, okay, you're already excited, but it's your first vote, so you still have no idea what to expect. Well, we're trying to get you ready so you know exactly what to do. When you get there, the first thing you're going to have to do is show an ID. And if you don't have one of the photo IDs, the poll worker is going to explain how you can vote without those IDs. Uh, and again, it helps to know which other IDs you can bring. Um, but the poll, worker, the poll workers love first-time voters. It's like, I work the polls. I don't know who else works the polls. You're like, Every time we see there, there is some polling place, like it's like it's like it's the joy of the day when a person that's voting for the first time. Uh, and in the constitutional, that's considered a boring election. I saw so many first time voters and it's like, oh, I was so, you know, happy. And then in Travis County and several of the surrounding counties, we vote electronically, but we have a paper ballot confirmation. So we get the speed and accuracy of electronic voting, but we have the additional safety net of having a paper backup. And when you check in, you receive a paper ballot that looks like a big long coupon like that, that all it has on it is some like barcode and a little like some digits that kind of tell what kind of ballot is going to be. You feed that, the machine reads the barcode and populates the screen with all the stuff you can vote on. There's no information about you there. It just has information of what things you can vote on. You make all your choices on the screen and uh, you get a chance to review, make changes. And if everything looks good, you print and you get to review again the print. And let's say you get to the papers like, oh no, I wrote, I voted for the wrong thing on this one. I messed it up. I just must have been not looking. Don't panic. You can actually fix it a couple of times. You can try to vote up to three times. You, if this happens, talk to the poll worker. 
they will go to cancel the paperwork and give you a new ballot so that you're not going to be voting twice you're just going to be voting once but you get a chance to fix it try to not do that three times because then you're out of luck uh but it's the, the whole thing like you know sometimes it's so many choices uh, you, you know it, it's easy to double tap something so just that's it the other thing that people worry about if the balance is super long it's like but how am i going to do research on all of this it's totally fine to skip phrases so if you don't know everything about every single thing on the ballot there is no penalty for skipping we of course we want everybody to vote on everything but it's totally fine if there's stuff that you really don't know how to make a decision just skip that don't have to guess just skip it's not a test and a lot of people think that the ballot is their receipt it's not the ballot is their vote and they haven't voted until they put that ballot in the scanner and you know the scanner scan saved the electronic information saved in the big like black box that has like a dual lock container and you get an i voted sticker so you know you voted when you get the i voted sticker uh, if you walk away with your ballot it's just like you just wrote a bunch of information on a piece of paper so keep saying that your vote matters and people usually is like yeah why would my vote matter like you know it's i'm one of millions of people voting for governor or for president well a vote always matter no matter how small but when you're voting for local elections it matters even more in a very direct way and i'm going to use a couple of examples that happened in 2022 and those are not off examples it's very common in local races to have numbers like that so in 2022 the city council uh, District 9, which is where both of us live, had a runoff. And the person that's in power now in charge of District 9 is one of 10 districts in the city of Austin. So it's a lot of people. It got decided by 34 votes. So the difference between the winner and the loser is 30, 343 votes. So I heard in another class that there is about like 307 seniors in this school. So if it was the district of this school, you'd be like super close if you all ganged up together and decided to vote for that person. You could have really, you just had to convince like a few parents and, and you flip that. But if you look at the commissioner, like a primary in the county commissioner, uh, that county commissioner is like city council, but at the county level. And there are only four for the entire Travis County. So it's like, it's a person that has power over like more than a quarter million people. Only 248 votes was the difference between the person that's in charge now and the person that lost. So just your high school would be enough for that. So that, that's like, those are concrete numbers. And there are numbers that are much more extreme. There is a, the a representative that we met the other day that represents a, a part of Austin her race she won by like was one no four votes and that was like a state seat so it's like it's a lot of people and uh i mean a state rep so it's a lot of people and there was on the news that was this uh, i forgot if it was michigan or ohio there was this guy that there were two guys running and it was on the news like a, just a few months ago and the guy won and his opponent for whatever reason forgot to vote and the guy that won won by one vote because his opponent didn't even bother to vote for himself so very few mo votes can make a ton of different difference in a lot of races so i mentioned before that we have elections and of course i'm i'm reiterate that because it was so early in the presentation that you might have forgotten uh, i mentioned primaries right and then so do you remember what i said what primaries were or like do you know what a primary is you want to kind of refresh anybody remember what i said or knew already what is a primary anybody know all right so a primary no takers a primary right if you have a bunch of people competing in a singing competition for instance 
you don't get like every single singer to sing about each other in one uh, against each other on one day you get you divide in groups and you have like elimination rounds so you usually get like different groups and then eventually you get like usually two groups that decides who goes into the finals so this is kind of like all the preliminary and like semifinals if you would or the regionals where each party decides who is going to run representing their party in the primary it is not just like you might hear on the news the primary for a presidential race but that's just one race there's primaries for all the parts and races for senators for judges for reps like in the state at the uh at the federal level um and depending on yeah there's a da supreme court there is like all the races so there's a lot of choices and the interesting thing is the primary is when you have a lot of choices when you go to november you just have the choices that the party is already pre-select but in the primaries you can choose somebody that really aligns with you and then later you get a limited choice then the dates here like the election day is march 5th so even uh, if you're going to be 18 by march 5th you can vote in the primary if not you can encourage your friends to and early voting is super soon it's february 20. so if you register today because we're still before the deadline to register if you're going to be 18 by march 5th and you register today you will be able to vote in the primary. So not only you're going to have a choice, it's a great way to learn how the system works. So when it comes later in November, you know exactly what to do. And you already did a preliminary research on the candidates. So you already know who you're going to, you know, the, the, the different candidates who are running because you already had to do that research. So it's great prep work. And I did mention there are many elections, and I'm showing the dates to reiterate that I, I mentioned that there are going to be three elections before I graduate, right? So the primaries, it's uh, March 5th, right? The early voting dates here. If, if we have any local elections in Austin or in any area that have local elections, that's May 4th. And a primary runoff, it's, I heard that it's, there's never a year that there was no runoff. And it, it's kind of like, you guarantee that it's at least one race somewhere is going to be. So May 28th is another opportunity. And then after that, you still have the opportunity to vote in the big election in November. So there's a lot of stuff. Okay, so you're not really super interested in voting, but does anybody here care about money? Anybody likes money? You can make money participating in the elections even before you can vote. So if you're in high school, you are at least 16 years old, you can work in election. By state law, you can work as a student clerk up to two days. In Travis County, normally they just assign election day because it's a little bit easier to coordinate. But Travis County, like you get paid the same as any election worker. In Travis County, you get paid 20 bucks an hour. Election day, you get to work 14 days. So 14, uh, 14 hours. 14 hours times 20 bucks. Anybody does the math here? How much money that is? Anybody interested? 14 times 20? It's a lot of money, right? 280. Okay, who said the 80? <laughs> all right so you can make 280 bucks uh, in one day it's a long day but it's one day you work that day it's great for your resume you get excuse time off school so like no school get money good resume and you learn how the system works even before you can vote or you can like if you're if you're family and friends are a little concerned about voting because they don't know how it works. If you become a poll worker, you can be the, the source of the information. And I'll bring this chart back here, but if you're interested, you can email the county. It helps to already say, I already talked to this teacher. I already have to talk to my, uh, my parents or guardians. Uh, they're all good with it because they're going to have to fill out a form. 
email, call, be the squeaky wheel because the county receives a lot of calls. Uh, the person that calls the most, they know they're more likely to be reliable because they need people to show up when they say they will. So if it's something you're interested in, want more info, we can talk at the end. And here's the thing that I didn't fix the graph. <laughs> uh, you can, the, there is no money on this, but it's also great for resume. You can become a volunteer deputy registrar like us. That means that you can help your friends to register to vote or your family. You have to be 18 for this, uh, but it's a great way to get people around you to participate and empower them as well. And if any of you are interested in doing that at the school and want help uh, doing a drive, you can talk to Mr. Tabasco and then he can connect with us and we'll help you. We'll provide materials, we'll provide guidance. Uh, but if you want to do like if you have a club, like if you have any kind of club that you participate at the school or after hours, uh, it's a great activity to do. So the presentation itself is done. We're now going around and going, we're going to ask individually if uh, who wants to register or if you have any questions, if you're already registered or how to kind of get additional information. So we're going to go around um, and uh, there is also a reminder card that you can fill out if you would like. Uh, that allows us to verify that your voter registration went through and also we'll make a point of contacting you for the first couple elections that you vote. But beyond that, we have a, an app called League in Action. Uh, and if you're registering, you're going to have like QR codes that, uh, on the seat. But if not, if you're already registered, if you want for later, you can sign up and set like what kind of reminders you might want the app to do so that you can kind of find that on your own. And then we'll be periodically posting relevant information about elections, especially local information that might be harder to find. So we're going to put dates, but also what's on the ballot, where to find more information, everything that you need so that when you show up to the polls, you know what to do. All right, let's go around.